uh, on current slide. Okay. And if you need to get out, yeah, it's somewhere. It's what? Yeah. All right. Good morning. I uh, I'm here with my IT person, my wife, and she's helped me set this up. I don't think anyone's logged in yet. Uh, I I'm not sure how I'll know, but I'll find out. This is brand new for me. Um, this is Math 112, uh, 8:30 class, and we are uh, going to try to pick up where we left off last time. Now, since I don't know that anyone's here, I can't mark anything on the attendance yet, but as you log in, then I will be able to, uh, to mark you on attendance. Um, and today, I hope, is the 17th. Okay. And um, this is where we left off last time, at least according to... Uh, my memory, which is not the best in the world. Uh, I think we finished 2.1 and we're getting started on 2.2. Polynomial functions and higher, uh, well, chapter two is polynomial functions, rational, polynomial and rational functions. Uh, the 2.2 section is polynomial functions of higher degree. If you recall, 2.1 dealt mostly with quadratic functions. It had some other stuff at the beginning, but we dealt mostly with quadratic functions. How are we going to deal with functions of higher degree? They're not nearly as easy as quadratic functions were, so let's see what the objectives are. We'll use transformations to sketch graphs of polynomial functions. We've done that before back in Chapter 1. Now, we're going to use what they call the leading coefficient test to determine the end behavior of graphs of polynomial functions. Now, I don't like to call it leading coefficient test, so the leading coefficient is used, I like to call it the leading term test because we use the whole leading term. And we'll go through what that is again when we get there. We'll also find and use real zeros of polynomial functions as sketching aids, okay, when we're sketching graphs. And you know this book loves to sketch graphs, so be ready for that. The last objective is to use the intermediate value theorem to help locate real zeros of polynomial functions. So we'll start with graphs of polynomial functions. If you're following in the text, this is on page 123. In this section, we'll study basic features of the graphs of polynomial functions. The first feature is that the graph of a polynomial function is always continuous. Uh, I hope you remember what that means from chapter 1 when we talked about piecewise defined functions, which weren't always continuous. A continuous function means there's no gaps, no holes, no missing values, no uh, discontinuities anywhere. That's just a continuous function. We'll talk about one other feature that's coming up later. Uh, essentially, this means that the graph has of a polynomial function has no breaks, no holes, no gaps, as shown here. This is an example of a polynomial function. Now, from my experience with this, I would guess that this is probably a cubic function, okay, uh, because it has two humps. We'll talk about that later, one hump and one valley, so to speak, okay? Now, here is a graph of, and that is an example of a piecewise defined function that is not continuous. It's defined for every value in the domain from negative infinity to positive infinity. However, at this value here, whatever that is, they didn't put a scale here, at this value here, let me get my pen set up. Yuck. Okay. It's not setting. There we go. At this value here, when x is equal to this value right here, your function is coming along here and is defined at that value there, but then once it gets past that value, it goes down to this other piece of the function, and you see you have a gap there. That is not continuous, okay? Now, even if this were continuous, but you had a hole in the graph, that's not con you know, technically continuous either. So, this is uh, fu functions with graphs that are not continuous 
are not polynomial functions. Each piece of that piecewise defined function could be a polynomial function, but the entire function is not. Okay? The second feature, and this is the one I was going to tell you about, uh, is that the graph of a polynomial function has only smooth, rounded turns. Now, they could be a pretty sharp turn, but it's still not pointed. A smooth, rounded turn. That one's definitely rounded. That's rounded. This is a little sharper, but it's still rounded. So, polynomial functions, their graphs are always two things, smooth and continuous. Okay? Now, again, if I was looking at this graph, I would make a guess. Uh, as a polynomial function, this one, a probably a fifth order polynomial function. Don't know that for sure, but it certainly has characteristics that you would expect from a fifth order polynomial function. Okay? So that could and probably is the graph of a polynomial function. Now, the opposite of smooth means <laughs> not smooth, pointed, cusp, you know, sharp turns. Polynomial function cannot have a sharp turn. For example, here is a graph of the absolute value function. Very typical V-shaped function there. Okay? Uh, pretty common function. F of X equals absolute value of X. But at 0, 0, it has a sharp turn. Not a smooth, gradual turn. A sharp turn. It's coming down in this direction from here and then goes out in a different direction at that point. There is no smoothness about it. It's very sharp, okay? Uh, that's not a polynomial function, okay? The graphs of polynomial function of the degree is greater than 2 or more are difficult to analyze, more difficult to analyze than the graphs of polynomials with degree 0, that's constant functions, degree 1, that's linear functions, and degree 2, quadratic functions, which we talked about last time. Now, let me just for this purpose of now, telling, showing you a couple of other graphs that are not smooth. One that comes down and does something like that. That is not smooth either. That is definitely, that's called a cusp. Okay? Um, trying to think if there are any other kinds that would be uh, like that. I can't think of any now. There probably are some. But uh, anything that's not smooth is not a polynomial function. Okay, um, so let's move on. However, using the features presented in this section, coupled with your knowledge that you already have of point plotting, intercepts, symmetry, that kind of stuff, you should be able to make reasonably accurate sketches by hand. Yeah, you can use graphing calculators if you want to, but these are not that hard to do. So the polynomial functions that have the simplest graphs are the monomial functions, remember these we call parent functions basically, f of x is equal to x to the n, where n is an integer greater than zero. So another way of saying that, a positive integer. Okay? Can't be zero, that would be a constant function. Okay? If it's one, that would be a, the linear function, that would be the identity function, f of x equal x. If it's two, that's your simple, uh, simplest parabola. Okay? And we did those a lot last time. And then anything greater, uh, those will be what we'll be looking at now. Then we'll expand on this a little bit later. Okay. So here's figure 2.9. And by the way, we're now on, got to keep up in the book, um, top of page 124. You can see that when n is even, the graph is similar to the parabola, the f of x equal x squared, the quadratic function. When n is odd, it's more similar to the cubic function. Okay, and here's what they mean. Here is your quadratic function, your parent quadratic function, y is equal to x squared, the gray line there. Okay, when it's x to the fourth, it passes through three of the same points, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, and positive 1, 1. Okay, if this was x to the 6th, it'd do the same. x to the 8th, it'd do the same. x to the 16th, it would do the same. Okay, 
Uh, the difference is that outside plus or minus one, the lower the degree, the more gradual it goes up. Okay? The higher the degree, the sh more sharply it goes up. Okay? But on the other hand, in between zero and one, I mean negative one and one, especially around zero, the lower the degree, it comes down and just kisses the origin there at zero, zero. But when you get a quartic function, degree four, it comes down and hangs around there uh, longer, but then goes up more sharply outside. Six would be even sharper on the outside and hanging around longer on the inside. Now, these are not zero values here. They look like they are, but they're not. They're just slightly more than zero, like 0 0.00001. Not zero, but still a very small number. So it looks like it plots right on there. Okay? Whereas the quadratic function just comes down and kisses the origin right there and goes right back off. These linger a bit longer. Okay. Now, when you have odd functions, I'm going to throw in one more. The identity function. It would go through 1, 1, 0, 0. I can't get my pen to write. And uh, negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, and positive 1, positive 1. Okay. That has no curvature in it at all. It just goes straight through. Your cubic function, which is the gray function here, it uh, comes up and just barely, and this shows it lingering a bit longer because it has a pretty wide scale here, uh, around zero and goes up. But then when it's x to the fifth, it comes up more sharply outside, minus one, and minus one, minus one and then flattens out even longer around zero, and then goes up more sharply at one line. Very similar to what the even functions do, the odd functions do the same thing, except they go as a mirror image around the origin, not a mirror image around the y-axis. Okay? So when n is odd, uh, the graph of x to the n crosses the axis at the x-intercept and proceeds. When n is even, the graph of y is equal to x to the n, touches the axis at the x-intercept at the origin and then proceeds up, in this case, when it's uh, proceeding upward uh, from there on, on both sides. Because any time you raise a positive number to an even power, it stays positive, of course. When you raise a negative number to an even power, it's also positive. But when you raise a negative number to a neg uh, an odd power, it goes negative. But a negative number, uh, a positive number to an odd power, of course, stays positive. Okay? So that's how you can tell that. Now that's leading us to one of the next big concepts. Okay? Well, this is saying what I said earlier. Moreover, the greater the value of n, whether it's even or odd, the flatter the graph is near the origin. That's what I was saying, lingering near the origin a bit longer. Okay? Now, they want us in uh, example one uh, to sketch the graph of each of these functions. Okay? Uh, in your text, you'll see this is also at larsenprecalculus.com, and you'll see an interactive version of this type of an example. Okay? So let's sketch the first one. f of x is equal to minus uh, x to the fifth. Now they've thrown something else in here on you, <laughs> okay? They were just talking about what you would call the parent functions, the simplest function. Here they've introduced the minus sign. We know how to handle that, don't we? Okay? So let that be my axes. Now I'll go on and tick off a few points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We aren't going to need that many. We sure don't need that. And then we'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now my pen seems very slow this morning. It may be because I'm teaching from home and we have a little bit slower um, Wi-Fi probably than the uh, system at school has. We'll just have to live with it. 
So let's plot a few points for A, and I'll use this color for A, okay? Certainly the easiest one, when x equals 0, your y is equal to 0, because 0 to the fifth power is 0, negative of 0 is 0, so y is 0. 0, 0, there it is, right there, okay? Now, let's pick another one, plus 1. When x is plus 1, 1 to the fifth is 1, but then you negate it, so it comes down here. It's the mirror image across the x-axis because we're reflecting across the x-axis, okay? When you get x equal minus 1, minus 1 to the fifth power is minus 1, but then you negate it, and it becomes positive 1, okay? From there, we can't do very much because when you do 2, 2 to the fifth is 32, okay? And then negate that, and it would be minus 32. Way, way off scale here. So this is coming from way down south here, coming up here, uh, and then flattening out, because this is to the fifth power, around zero, and then taking off and going up this way. Now that looks a lot like a negative cubic function. It just is sharper, going up more sharply, outside plus or minus one, and flatter near zero. Okay, now, I'm going to use the same axis here, uh, and since I, nobody's logged in yet, I can't ask anyone what color they want. I'm going to go with Carolina blue, if that's okay. It seems like somebody in the class, maybe Zach, maybe liked Carolina blue. So let's go with that, and let's do this one, okay? Now, the B one, H of X is equal to X plus 1 to the 4th. Now, notice there's something a little different here. We have a plus 1. Here we had a minus in front that reflected it across the x-axis. This has a plus 1 to the x. What does that do for us? It shifts our origin, you might say, one unit. Remember, it's dealing with the x, so it goes backward. One unit to the left, okay? So there is where our new origin is. But this is an odd function, so when x is equal to 0, say, 0 plus 1 is 1, uh, 1 to the fourth power is 1. So there we are there. Let's go 1 to the left, uh, negative 2, okay, I don't know what I said before, negative 1 plus 1 is 0, I said 0 plus 1, okay. I don't know what I'm talking about. Negative 1 plus, zero, plus 1 is 0. Uh, no, I, I was right. When x equals 0, forget all that. When x equals negative 2, negative 2 plus 1 is minus 1. Raise that to the fourth power, you're at plus 1 again. Now, anything past this, and we're way off scale, okay? Because when you go x equal 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 to the 4th power is 16, which is way off scale. So this is coming down very sharply from here, passing through here, flattens out near 0, and then heads up very sharply on the other side. It's not quite a parabola. It hangs around near the x-axis a little too long for a parabola, and then she goes up more sharply outside. But that's how h of x looks, okay? I wish someone were logged in so I could say, are there any questions, okay? Uh, but that's my scratch. Let's look at how the book did it. Hopefully pretty similarly. All right, so I'll erase all this ink on the slide. And we'll go to that. Here's the first one, and sure enough, Everything is reflected across the x-axis from x to the fifth, which we saw earlier. And now when x equals positive 1, the value is negative 1 because of that negation there. And when x equals negative 1, that normally would have been negative 1 to the fifth would be negative 1, but the negation makes it a positive 1. So it's going like this, but it's very steep past minus 1, very flat near zero, and very steep past positive one, okay? The negative coefficient has the effect of reflecting the graph in the x-axis, okay? 
this graph looks a lot like y is equal to, actually, if you're saying this properly, you would say minus x to the third, because that would look very similar to this, okay? But the shape is like x to the third is what they're getting at, okay? So let's do the b one now. Here's the b. The graph of this is shown here. A left shift of one unit from here, that the plus one, remember everything that you deal with in the, uh, uh, if it's dealing with an x, it seems to be backward, okay? So a left shift by one unit of y is equal to x to the fourth. How does x to the fourth look? Very sure, okay. No matter whether you put a plus or a minus in here, when you raise it to the fourth power, it's going to be positive. So that's why everything's on the up and up here. Uh, and it's pretty steep outside because you shift the one to the left, minus two here. Very flat around minus one because that's your new zero, so to speak. And then very steep outside zero, which is your new plus one. Okay. And if you were to have plugged in a minus one here, you'll see h of minus one would be minus one plus one is zero, zero to the fourth is zero. So that's how you get that point there. It's the other way to do it if you don't want to just deal with a horizontal shift. So there's example one, A and B. Now, as I say every time, or I try to remember to say every time, now you have your checkpoint, okay? Two very similar to this. You're at home now. You don't, I don't know if you're going to any other classes today, so as soon as you can, after you hear this, do your checkpoints, okay? And since no one's logged in now, whenever you're listening to this, now I don't know how long it's going to take for this to load. Um, usually in the morning, things load fairly quickly, but in the evening, they don't, okay? I still had three classes left over from yesterday that hadn't loaded. One loaded late last night because I was home, not at school. But the second one didn't. It's loading now. Hopefully, the third one will load. And then when I get off of here, Hopefully this one will work. Then they'll be at YouTube videos. All right, let's move on to the next topic, which is the leading coefficient test. And again, I don't like to call it leading coefficient test. I call it the leading term test. And I think you'll see why I call it that just shortly. Okay? So, if you noticed in example one, let's go back and look. There was a a uh, graph of something where if you had expanded this x plus 1, raise it to the fourth power, your first term would have been x to the fourth. Then you would have had a term with x cubed in it. Then you'd have had an x squared term. Then you would have had an x term. Then you'd have had a constant term. But the leading term would have been x to the fourth. Notice when that leading term is an even power, it's going on the up and up as long as the leading coefficient is positive, okay? When we had this one, which was an odd exponent, one's going up, one's going down. Well, which is going where? When x gets very large positively, this is going down because that negative sign reverses the direction. When x is going negative, it's going positive because that negative sign change the direction. But again, the leading term here was a minus x to the fifth. The odd exponent tells you for large values, it's going to be very, very large, either positive or negative, and the ne negative sign flips it from what you would expect. A large positive goes negative, a large negative goes positive. We looked earlier, well, these are very similar, odd x Exponents go in opposite directions, third, fifth. Even exponents go in the same direction, up and up, okay? Whether your x's are increasing negatively or positively. Let's go back to some of these. Now, that wasn't a polynomial. Here's a polynomial function. Now, this appears to be, and this is why I said, my guess is to be in a fifth-degree polynomial. Why? Because when x is getting more negative, this is going way south x going more positive, way north. So not only would I say this is an 
odd exponent, it would also be a plus coefficient because positive go positive, negative go negative. Okay? Let's go back one more. That's not a polynomial function. Here's one. I was guessing cubic, but I do know it's got to be odd. When it, x is going negative, your value is going negative. When x is going positive, your value is going very, very positive. So that indicates it is, an, and again, all you can say here, you have a, your leading term is going to have an odd exponent and a positive coefficient. Okay? Let's go back to where we were, and we'll see how they explain it. That leading coefficient test, which I call the leading term test. In that first example, both graphs eventually rise or fall without bound as x moves very large to the right or very large to the left, either direction. Whether the graph of a polynomial function eventually rises or falls can be determined by two, I want to say factors, but that's uh, two conditions. One is the, the function's degree, which is the leading term's exponent. If that is even, that tells you one thing. If that leading term exponent is odd, that tells you something else. The second feature is the leading coefficient. Is it positive or negative? Okay, so they call it leading coefficient test. I like to call it the leading term test because we're taking two bits of information from the leading term, both the even or oddness of its exponent and the positive or negativeness of its sign. Okay, so here's how the leading coefficient test goes. As x moves without bound, either to the left, getting more negative, or to the right, getting more positive, the graph of a polynomial function always, always, eventually goes very, very, very large. Okay? When n is odd, that exponent leading terms exponent n is, law, is, is uh, odd, that means that when you raise a very large, say, negative value of x to an odd power, your whole term becomes negative. Unless, of course, the a is negative, then it flips it over and makes it positive. So this is good only when a, that leading coefficient, is positive. Then this goes south because large Negative values are going to make large negative values. Large positive values for x will make large positive values for uh, your y. Because these terms down here get completely swamped by that leading term. Okay? If this n here was a 17, it, well, let's just take it simpler. Remember when that was a 5. Okay? And I said x to the fifth power is 32. x to the fourth power is only 16. So after a while, that leading term is going to swamp all the others. So that's why we focus on the leading term. Okay? So if the leading coefficient is positive, okay, that's the first thing, uh, the a sub n is greater than zero, then the graph falls to the left, rises to the right. Now here's this nomenclature here, this way of expressing it is how you're going to see it on homework exercises and you'll also see it on quizzes and tests this way. Now I usually start with the x is not the f of x. It doesn't really matter. Okay? But on this one here, they've done it. I'm going to erase my drawings because that's sort of ugly. Um, but here's how I would write it, say, on on a quiz or a test, okay? I start off with as x goes to blank, f of x goes to blank. As x goes to blank, f of x goes to blank, okay? Now, That's how you're going to see it. Let me give you a hint right now. 
you can fill in every blank with an infinity. Okay? For a polynomial function, you can do this. Any other functions, you can't. But polynomial function, you can't. Now, another hint, okay? One of these x's is going to be positive, one's negative. I don't care which. I'll put the negative here, leave that one positive. Now you've got two of them completely right. They'll always be that way. What your mission is, is to determine what the f of x is doing, okay? If the a is positive, if this is negative, oh, and n is, and n is odd. If a is positive and n is odd, then if this is negative, that's negative. If this is positive, that's positive. There's your answer. That would be the one here. And that's exactly what they show. They say f of x is going to positive infinity as x goes to positive infinity. f of x is going to negative infinity as x goes to negative infinity. Okay? But if you were a situation like this, again, an odd exponent for the leading term, odd exponent, that means it's going in opposite directions, okay? But if your leading coefficient is negative, then these things change. As x goes negative, f goes positive. As x goes positive, f goes negative, okay? Again, your four blanks are going to have infinities in them for polynomial functions. Now, don't confuse them with what we're going to do later with rational functions. With polynomial functions, every one of those blanks is going to have an infinity in it. One of your x is going to be positive, one's negative. I don't care which order you put them. They're going to be that way. And then your mission is to decide what the signs of the f of x's are. And if that leading coefficient, if, this, if your n is odd, and the leading coefficient is positive, then these signs are the same. If it's negative, then the signs are opposite. Okay? That's if n is odd. Now let's go to the case with n being even. Doesn't matter what it is, 4, 16, 83, 4, 82, whatever, it just has to be an even number. Then it's either going to be on the up and up or down and down. It's got to be. Because that leading term x to the 18th say okay if x is positive this thing's going to be positive really positive if x is negative this is still really really positive okay so that was a pretty easy one to do as x goes to blank f of x goes to blank as x goes in the other direction blank, then f of x goes somewhere, okay? Now, if n is even and your coefficient is positive, okay? Again, okay, let me start over. Every one of these blanks for polynomial functions is going to have an infinity in them. No question about it, okay? One of the x is going to be minus, one's going to be positive. I don't care which order you put them. If this n is even and the coefficient is positive, both of these f's are positive. No choice about it. If that's an even exponent, no matter whether it's a positive number or a negative number, you square it, you raise it to an even power, it's going to be positive. Okay? But if that leading coefficient is negative, okay, that's going to flip everything over, okay? So the x's stay the same, but now the f goes negative in both cases. That would be this case, okay? Again, leading coefficient negative, but your uh, degree of the leading term is positive, okay? Now, Go back here for a moment. What's going on in here? That's determined by all these other terms here. Yeah, it can go up and down, do all sorts of weird things there. But in the long run, in the end behavior, it's dominated by the first term. So ultimately, it's going here and here. Anything in here is determined by these terms here. They still have some sort of sway. But the, uh, the long term, and that's why we call this the end behavior. What's happening for very large x's 
both very large positive and very large negative. Same thing here. What happens in here is determined by those other terms, okay, and what happens in here is determined by the other term. But what happens in the long run is that leading coefficient. The degree of the leading coefficient, whether it's even or odd, and then, of course, the sign of the leading coefficient. Uh, I think I said that backward. Leading exponent, whether it's even or odd, uh, that's going to determine which directions it's going, uh, you know, whether they're going the same direction or opposite directions. The even exponents will go in the same directions, and the odd exponents go in opposite directions. The leading term, whether it's positive or negative, uh, for an even exponent, then if that a sub n, that leading coefficient is positive, this is on the up and up. Got to be. And if it's negative, it's going down, down. That's x gets very, very large. Okay. That's called the leading, I call it the leading term test, and that determines the end behavior, what happens in the long run for very negative or very large positive x's for any polynomial function. So, let's do it. example two here. Describe the right-hand and left-hand behavior, the end behavior of the graph of each function. Let me set it up for you. Let, no, I'm sorry, as, okay, all right, sorry, okay. This PowerPoint does weird things sometimes. Okay. Okay. As x goes to blank, f of x is going to blank. As x goes to blank, f of x is going to blank. Okay? Guess what? On these, you can fill in the blanks. Every blank for a polynomial function is going to have an infinity in it. That's what we're interested in. The end behavior is x is very large, positive and negative. And since we're doing that, let's make 1x negative, 1x positive. You got most of the problem solved already. The only thing you have to determine, what is the end behavior doing? What is the f doing for large negative x's and large positive x's? That's what your question is. And here's a simple way to do it, in my mind. Okay? You can remember the rule if you wanted to, but I just pick a pretty large x. And it doesn't have to be very big either. Like 10. That's not too big. 10 raised to the, and that's a large positive x. So we're dealing with this one. If 10 raised to the third power is 1,000, this will be a negative 1,000 plus 40. Who cares about the plus 40? The end behavior would then be negative. Okay? But if this x were negative, like negative 10, negative 10 raised to the third power would be negative 1,000, but then the minus sign in front reverses it and makes it positive, so that one would be plus. If x is a large negative number, the f is large positive. If x is large positive number, f is large negative. That's because it's an odd exponent, but a negative coefficient. Odd exponent means the f's go in opposite directions, always. And the negative sign flips them from where you would expect them to go. You would expect a minus, large minus x to make a large minus y. Not with a minus sign in front, it flips it. Okay? Let's do the same thing here. I think I'll do this in a different color. We'll go back to... Uh, Zach's baby, uh, Carolina Blue, as x goes to blank, f of x goes to blank, as x, I can't write, goes to blank, f of x goes to blank. Um, I just happened to think... Uh, I'm going to pause for just a second here. I'll be right back. I'm sorry. I just realized I'm in the dining room and we don't have a clock in here. So I didn't know how I was doing on time. I should have just 
looked and seen how much, how long I had talked, but I didn't want to go way over. Okay, so here we go. We know what to do. Every blank is going to contain an infinity. We just don't know the sign of every one. Okay, this is a pretty ugly one. That one's not too great. This one's pretty ugly, too. Okay, there we go. And we'll always choose one x to be negative and one positive. It doesn't matter which one you do. So I'll do them that way. Let me make this look a little bit better here. Okay. All right. Now, because this is an even exponent, you know these both have to go in the same directions, and because that's a plus sign there, both of those alphas are plus. You're done. That's it. That's your answer. All right. Now let's do C. This time let's go with, how about purple? Okay. And again, your question is, describe the right and left-hand behavior. Now, they always say right, which leading with the positive. I always start with negative, but it doesn't really matter, like I said. Okay, so your, to answer this, is going to be as x goes to blank, f of x goes to blank, as x goes to a different blank, f of x goes to some blank. I don't know if it's different or the same. Boy, this pen is not doing well at all. Okay? I'm not doing very well, I guess. Okay? It's sort of dragging in places and not writing in other places. Okay? And again, we know that every blank contains an infinity. It's not writing. Okay? Okay. We know one x is going to be minus and one's going to be positive. We got... Just about everything done, okay? Now we look here. X raised to an odd power, that means these two signs for your else are going to be different, okay? Which way is which? Again, I forgot to do this on B, but you could have. Uh, but let's go back and, and, and do it now for C. Let's say X equal 10. It's so easy to do. When X equal negative 10, okay, then... Negative 10 raised to the fifth power, an odd power, is going to be negative 100,000. <laughs> That's going to negative infinity, in my mind, okay? And when x is going to positive 10, it's not a very large number, but 10 raised to the fifth power is 100,000 going to positive infinity. So there you have it, okay? That's how you do these. Either remember the rules or... Just plug in, I like plus and minus 10 because they're a pretty good size number and certainly they're, uh, when you raise them to the fifth power, they're going to be very, very large numbers. All right, let's see how the book did it. Okay, they actually drew a graph because the degree of that first one, negative x cubed plus 4x, is an odd degree. The leading coefficient has, uh, the leading term has an odd degree. 3, and the leading coefficient happens to be negative, that means when x is very large negative, the f of x is very large positive. But on the other hand, when x is very large positive, that negative sign is going to drive the f of x is very large negative. There's the graph of it, and sure enough, uh, that's what we said. Let's see if they, oh, they don't. Uh, now, they're using just words here. Rises to the left, falls to the right. If you like to use the words, they're okay too. But most of the time in the text, I think in the homework exercises, you're going to be filling in the blanks. Okay? But, uh, anyway, you can do it either way. Here is the B one. Because the degree is even, that means at the end behavior is going in the same direction. Okay? either up and up or down and down. So now we look at the leading coefficient. It's positive. That means it's on the up and up. So when x goes very large negative, your f of x is going very large positive. When x goes very large positive, f of x is also going very large positive because there's a plus sign there, even coefficient. 
Okay? Now, the next one, x to the fifth minus x, again, because the leading coefficient is odd, they're going in opposite directions, and because the uh, leading, the leading the, the exponent of the leading term is odd, the leading coefficient is positive, that means when x is negative, your f is going to be negative. When x is positive, the f is positive because those are odd exponents. Okay? Make sense? It falls to the left, rises to the right. Okay. Stand up, sit down, fight, 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 or whatever. Okay. Now, in that example two we just did, and that, by the way, I forgot to turn the pages, was on page 126. By the way, there is a checkpoint after it. After every example, there's a checkpoint. Please do those as soon as you can after you've done this. In fact, if you're just listening to this by the recording, since no one has indicated they've joined the, the class, uh, then the uh, uh, you'll have time. If you want to just stop the recording, you can do the checkpoints right then. And then go on to the next part, do the checkpoint when you get to the next one. That would be a pretty good way of reinforcing what we just talked about. Okay. But, as they say here, in example two, which we just did, note that the leading term test tells you only whether the graph eventually rises or falls to the right or left. The long run, what happening for very large x's, positive or negative. Other characteristics of the graph, remember the dotted parts in there, such as the intercepts, max, min, those kinds of things, you have to use different tests for them. The leading term test only what tells you what's happening in the long run for very large x's, positive or negative. Okay? So, what we get to next is a real big issue in precalculus. What are your zeros of your polynomial function? What do we mean by zeros? That's where the function's equal to zero. And where is that? That's where the intersects the x-axis, because your y is zero everywhere on the x-axis. So that's what we're going to be dealing with here. What are the real zeros of these polynomial functions? All right? It can be shown, this is at the top of page 127 now, it can be shown that for polynomial function f of degree n, the following statements are true. First, the function f, polynomial function of degree n, has at most n real zeros. Oh, let's see if that's true. Okay. There was a degree 5. It had three zeros. Can't have more than five. Can't have fewer, but uh, can't have any more. Okay. Here was degree 4. One, two, three, four zeros. There are the zeros where it crosses the x-axis. Okay? I'll circle them so you can see them. I'm still in purple. Okay? Four zeros. That's the most it can ever have. What does that tell you? This thing isn't going to come up here and turn around and come back down again ever. Okay? It cannot because it already reached the maximum number of zeros. Let's go on back. This one, degree three. One, two, three. Three zeros. That's all it can have. This can't turn around and come back. That one can't turn around and come back. They're on the their final path. Okay. Uh, let's go to here. Uh, those don't show very much. Okay. This has only one zero. Can't have more than four. It only has one. This only has one. These are not very interesting. So let's. Uh, Oh, let's go back to those. Now, this is not really very fair, but you see, this is degree four. It's wanting to have more zeros, but it just can't get past that one. Uh, that's why it hangs around there so close. Ah, uh, that's a silly way to look at it. Let's go back to where we left off. My PowerPoint is slowing down like crazy. There we go. I have to be very gently on this. Okay. So, there's the first issue. The function f has at most its degree number of zeros. At most. It doesn't have to have that many, but it's the most it can have. Number two, though, the graph has at most 
n minus 1 turning points. What's a turning point? It's a point that we were calling relative minimum or maxima, points at which the graph changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Well, let's go back and see. Degree n, n minus 1 turning points. Well, this is degree 5. It has at most four turning points. Well, it only has one, two. Okay? No, yeah, one, two. Okay? This one has one, two, three turning points. Four minus one, three. That's all the turning points it can possibly have. This one, three minus one is two. One, two. Two turning points. Okay? All right? And we could go on back and see the others. But none of the others, I think, showed very much. Okay? I did want to point out this one. Let me go back and show this. Okay, this has only one turning point. Max could, could have was three, but it only has one. This one, however, doesn't have a turning point. It almost has one here. It's coming down. And it almost changes its direction, but then it decides to keep going south, okay? So this has no turning points. But as you can see, if you separated this a little bit, this probably would go down here, back up here, and down like that. Then it would have two, okay? But as it is written. But that's why, because it has no other terms here to create that variation there. So it only has, it has zero turning points. Just a little bit of an aside. You don't need to know that yet, if at all. Oh, wait. Yeah. So, at most, n minus 1 turning points. Now, finding the zeros of polynomial functions is one of the most important problems in algebra. And I sort of tried to mention that to you. Uh, it's, it's crucial. Okay? There is a strong interplay between the graphs and the algebraic approaches to the problems. Okay, I've already sort of alluded to this. When f is a polynomial function and a is any real number, the following statements are all equivalent. Okay, the first statement. If x equal a is a zero of the function, that's what we were just talking about. x equal a is a zero of the function. That means that x equal a is a solution when you set the function equal to zero. That's what we mean by being a zero of the function. Well, we knew that one already. We did that back in section one. But here's another equivalent statement. x minus a is a factor of that polynomial f. Whoa. So if x equal a is a zero, x minus a is a factor. Hey, we knew that. Because remember when we factored a polynomial, when you unfold it, remember I'm going to go back to black here, or dark anyway. Okay, when you unfold it and you had, let's say, x squared uh, plus 3x minus 4 equals 0. If that's what you had, okay? First thing you would do is try to factor this. It'd be an x and an x. Okay. Opposite signs because the last sign is negative, so one of these is minus, one is positive. And four and one should do it for us, right? Well, these are the factors of that polynomial. You can foil it and see x times x is x squared, plus four x minus x is plus three x minus four. Yeah. That works. These are factors. Well, then what's the next statement we would do? We say each one of them equals 0. x minus 1 equals 0. Or x plus 4 equals 0. And this is to give you x equal 1 would be a 0. And x equal negative 4 would be a 0. Well, we just set it in reverse. If x equal a is a 0, then x minus a, the opposite one, you bring it back across the equal sign, that's a factor. Before, we factored first and found our zeros. Now, if we know that's a zero, we know those are factors. Okay? And the one other way to express this same thing is if you have the graph of f, okay, then a zero is going to be an intercept. Well, of course. Okay? 
If this is a zero of the polynomial, that means when y is equal to zero, when x is equal to a. x equal a, y is equal to zero, that means a zero is an intercept, x-intercept of the graph of f. Okay? Those are the things listed there on page 127. Okay. Here's example three then. Find all the real zeros of this polynomial. Okay. Then determine the maximum number of turning points of the graph of the function. Well, before we determine all real zeros, what's the maximum number of zeros you can have? For that polynomial function, just find that leading, the uh, degree of the leading term. Four, the most zeros you can have is four. We might not have four, but the most you can have is four. So how do we find those zeros? Well, first thing to do, just like we said before, factor. And always we look for greatest common factor. And since the leading thing here is a minus sign. I don't like leading off with minus, so let's pull that out as a factor. Each term has a 2 in it. Each term has an x squared in it. So let's factor out a minus 2x squared. And then see what we have left. Well, minus 2 into minus 2 is 1. x squared into x fourth would be x squared, so that's going to be an x squared. And Minus into plus will be minus, and 2x squared into 2x squared is going to be 1. Okay? Are we through factoring? Well, the first term we can't do anything else, minus 2x squared. But the, that second factor here, you can. This is going to be x plus 1 times x minus 1. Now we factored it completely. Okay? We still haven't found the zeros. What are the zeros? They're when this thing is equal to zero. And now we go back and set like we used to do. Either minus 2x squared is equal to zero. Well, of course, that's going to yield to divide both sides by minus 2. Can't write. And you get x squared equals zero. Only way that can be true is x equals zero. But you know you got two x's there. So in a sense, and we're going to get to this in just a little while, maybe not today, but in just a little while, x is what we call a double root. A double zero, okay? However you want to call that. Or a zero of multiplicity two. We'll call it that later. Let's do the other two terms. x plus one equals zero. That's going to yield x equal minus 1, if you subtract 1 from both sides, okay? Or x minus 1 equals 0, that's going to yield, boy, this pen is not writing well at all, okay? That's going to yield x equals 1, okay? This one time you would add both 1 to both sides. That's how we wound up with that instead of 0, okay? Now, how many zeros we got? One, two, three. Less than four, but four was the max you could have. But you see, we said this one happens to be a double root. It is two zeros, <laughs> x equals zero, x equals zero. Okay. Uh, now it says determine the maximum possible number of turning points of the graph. Well, again, you look at that leading exponent. It's a four. You do 4 minus 1, it has at most three turning points. And I think it will have all three. Okay? Uh, it's almost got to have it. So, they didn't say graph it. They said maximum turning points. I think they're going to graph it for us. Thank you very much. So let me erase my scratch here. And here's to find the real zeros of the function set f of x equal to 0. That's what we did. Now, factor. Factor everything in sight. Okay? Pull out the minus 2x squared. That leaves us x squared minus 1. The first term, uh, minus 2x squared, we'll get to that. Factor the second term of second factor. 
x plus 1 times x minus 1, okay? And the real zeros are x equals 0 from here, x equal 1 from there, x equal minus 1 from there. Three zeros. You could have had up to four, but that's because this zero was a double root. Multiplicity of two, we'll later call it. Okay, because the function is a fourth degree polynomial, the, f, the graph of f can have at most four minus one or three turning points. Let's see if they're going to do the graph for us. Well, here was our zeros. Also, x-intercepts, minus one, zero, 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 and plus one, zero. That's why I said it's got to have three turning points. It, and by the way, what is in behavior? Look at the leading term. The exponent is even, meaning it's going in the same direction. And since the leading coefficient is negative, that means it's going down and down. Okay? So your leading term test is still applies here. It's going down and down. So it's coming from down. Has the cross here, touches here, and crosses here. One, two, three three turning points. That's all you could possibly have. Now, we're going to get to something else a little bit later. But remember, this was x equal minus 1. This is x equal plus 1. Those were single x-intercepts. Okay? So it crosses there. crosses at those two. This one, remember, I said was a double. That means it comes down but doesn't cross, changes its mind, and goes back up again. That means it just touches there. If a zero has multiplicity 2 or 4 or 6 or 8, any even multiplicity, it touches the x-axis but doesn't cross it. If it has an odd multiplicity, like these were 1, that's not really much of a multiplicity, it's 1, but if it was a 3, 5, 7, just like x to the cubed, x to the fifth, x to the they come up, cross, and keep on going. These do too. Okay? It's just that if it's multiplicity 3 or 5, it would hang around that 0 longer, but still cross. We'll get to that in just a minute. Okay? So, but in that example, like I jumped ahead and said, uh, note that uh, because the exponent is greater than 1, okay, the factor... Minus 2x squared yields a repeated 0 at x equals 0. Okay? And this is good for any 0 of a function. If a factor x minus a is raised to the kth power, and k is any number greater than 1, that means it's a repeated 0 at x equals a. And the multiplicity is k, whatever that exponent is. So this had a multiplicity of 2. x equals 0 with a multiplicity of 2. Okay? That was how we express that. Now, if k, and by the way, when that k is an odd number, this was an even number here, if that's an odd number, the graph ultimately crosses at that value. Okay? It may do this. That may be our 0. It may come up, hang around, but it ultimately will cross. Okay? If it's multiplicity of 1, it just goes right through. It doesn't hang around. It just goes right through. But it still crosses. Okay? But if that k is even, like it was here, it comes down and doesn't cross, hangs around, and goes back in the same direction. That would be a multiplicity of 2 or 4 or 6 or whatever. Even multiplicity. It touches the graph. It does not cross the x-axis. Okay. At that zero. All right. So to graph a polynomial function, use the fact that the polynomial function can change signs only at its zeros. It may not change sign at its zero if it's a multi even multiplicity, but that's the only place it can change sign. Why is that true? Because polynomial functions have those two characteristics. Remember? Smooth and continuous. So, guess what? It has to cross the x-axis before it can change sign. Has to. No way around it. It can't have any breaks, and it's got to be smooth. Between two consecutive zeros, the polynomial must be either totally positive or totally negative. It can't change signs in between two consecutive zeros. Otherwise, it would have another zero in between, and they wouldn't be consecutive. 
So this is getting, this is the paragraph that's at the top of page 128. Okay. Uh, that means that when you put the real zeros of a polynomial function in order on the x-axis, remember they're x-intercepts, they divide the real number line into intervals in which the function has no sign change. So in between any two zeros, there's no more sign changes there. Those resulting intervals are called test intervals in which you can choose a representative x value in between those two zeros to determine whether the value of the polynomial function is positive above the x-axis or negative below the x-axis. Okay? Now, they're skipping example 4 and 5 before they get to intermediate value theorem. So let's back off. Okay, this will probably be a good place to go. But before we do that, let me check the time. Oh, we've still got eight minutes. Okay, so let's try to get example four done. Okay. Sketch the graph of f of x. Why in the world would he wouldn't put one of these on the slideshow? I don't know. Uh, f of x is equal to 3x to the 4th minus 4x cubed. Okay? Sketch the graph of that. Before I do anything, I'm going to look at my end behavior. And frankly, I'm going to change my graph now. Okay. Now, I'll explain why I did that later. Okay. Now, um, in behavior, even exponent, that means it's going to be up and up or down and down. Positive coefficient, that means it's going to be up and up. So we know this is going up ultimately in both directions. So first thing I do, determine end behavior. Okay, we'll see how that pans out. Next thing, find our zeros. How do we find our zero? Set this equal to zero. Okay, and then how do we do that? We factor, if we can. If we can't, we try something else. We'll talk about those something else later. Only common factor here, the greatest common factor is x cubed. And what do you have left? 3x minus 4. That's equal to 0. Okay? So either 3x is equal to 0. I'm sorry, x cubed is equal to 0. Well, that's going to be x equals 0 with a multiplicity of 3 because the exponent is 3. Okay? Or... 3x minus 4 is equal to 0. And here, add 4 to both sides. And that wipes out those. 3x is equal to 4. Divide by 3. And x equal 4 thirds. Okay? Let's tick off a few points here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Positive 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Negative 1, 2, maybe more. We'll see. Okay? We know x equals 0. That's going to be 0, zero of the function. We also know it's going to have a multiplicity of four, 3, so it's going to be changing signs. Okay? Because it's odd multiplicity. It's going to hang around there a while, but it's going to change signs. The other one is 4 thirds. That is 1 and a third right about there. There's our second 0. Okay, now, with just those two pieces of information, two out of the four zeros you could have, but one has a multiplicity of three, so there's the other two, uh, you know this has to be coming from up here somewhere. Okay, and we know as it's coming from up here, it's going to come down here and kind of hang around here a little while, but ultimately it's going to cross, but then it has to go back up because... The end behavior here is up. The end behavior here is up. 
you know, without doing anything else, that's roughly what this function is going to look like. Not sure for certain, but as I said before, we could do some test intervals. I'll sit down for a moment here. Uh, the test intervals here, we could choose x equal minus 1, x equal 1, and x equal 2, just to see where this function is going then. So let's see, when x is equal to minus 1, f of minus 1 is going to be 3 times minus 1 to the fourth power minus 4 times minus 1 to the third power. Well, this is be 3. Any time you have a minus or even power, it's just going to be, it's going to be even. And 1 to the fourth power is 1. I like that. Okay. Minus 4 times, but negative 1 to an odd power is going to be negative. So that's going to be negative 1. So this is going to be uh, 3 minus a minus is plus 4 equals 7. Well, let's see. x equals minus 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Boy, I just barely got it in there. Look at that. Not too far off. I fudged a little bit, but I think it's pretty close. Okay. Let's do another interval. I mean, another value. In this test interval, in between those two zeros, we'll do x equal 1. Ah, that's not going to be bad. Alpha of 1 is equal to 3 times 1 to the 4th minus 4 times 1 cubed. And guess what? When you have 1 as your value, all you have left, no matter what you're doing here, those are all 1. That's 3 times 1 is 3 minus 4 times 1 is negative 4. This is going to be a minus 1. What is that value? Look at that. Not too far off there either. Let's do a 2 and see what we get. Alpha of 2 is equal to, get out of there, 3 times 2 to the 4th minus 4 times 2 cubed. Okay, that's from there. This will be 3 times 2 to the 4th is 16 minus 4. 2 cubed is 8, so this will be 48 minus 32 equals 16. Well, I can't see 16 on here, but it's somewhere past there. I came a little too far to the right on that one, so this will be somewhere up there. Sure enough, that worked, but we really didn't need it. We knew M behavior was here and here, odd multiplicity here, so it had to cross, Odd multiplicity here, 1, it had to cross, had to be in behavior there. There was no option. It had to be something that looked like that. Okay? And if you look in your book, this is example 4, you'll see <laughs> it looks kind of like that. Mine's a little wigglier, but it still looks pretty much like that. And that is also followed by a checkpoint. Please do your checkpoint. All right, we got one minute left. I don't think we have time for another uh, example five. We'll begin that next time. Okay, let me say this. Every Tuesday and every Thursday, I'll try to have this set up, and we'll be having class at 8.30 just as normal. Okay, so come Thursday, I'll try to have your code out there. Notice it didn't kick me out, or at least I don't think it did. So anyway, uh, but no one was listening anyway, but at least it gave me practice doing it. So anyway, here we go. Uh, we'll begin there. Let me give you homework home exercises here. I would do all of 9 through 14, okay? Uh, only the odds are in the back of the book and at calpchat.com, but you should be able to pick out all of those functions that are just matching. Okay, then do either, and they're all at CalcChat, as I said, or the odds are at CalcChat. Then do either 15 or 17, they're both at CalcChat, 17's at CalcView. Any of the odds, 19 to 27, they're all at CalcChat, 21's at CalcView. Either 29 or 31, they're both at CalcChat. Any of the odds, um, 33 through 47, they're all at CalcChat with 43 at CalcView. Um,
I guess we'll stop there. 49 and 51 are requiring you to use a graphing utility. See if you can do those on your own. They're pretty involved, so if you can't, don't sweat it. Uh, unless you have a graphing calculator or something, then you might find that useful to look at. All right, that'll do it for today. I'll hope to see all of you Thursday morning right around 8.30. Now, again, sometimes it takes a little longer for me to get this thing set up and running right. I hope it's running right today. We'll see. But I'll end this and also end the Zoom.